Bonjour tout le monde. Uh, Aujourd'hui, nous avons le plaisir d'avoir le Dr. Ruchika Prakash avec nous. Uh, Dr. Prakash est professeur au département de psychologie de l'Ohio State University. Elle est directrice du Center for Cognitive and Behavioral Brain Imaging, un centre de recherche en neuroimagerie des points situé dans le département de psychologie. Dr. Prakash a obtenu son doctorat en psychologie clinique à l'Université of Illinois Urbana-Champaign en 2009. La même année, elle a commencé à travailler comme professeur adjoint à l'Ohio State University et a créé le Clinical Neuroscience Lab. L'objectif de son programme de recherche est de développer et de tester l'efficacité de, de diverses interventions corps esprit pour améliorer la santé cognitive et effective des personnes âgées et des personnes souffrant des handicaps neurologiques. Elle a publié plusieurs articles scientifiques. Elle a reçu la Rising Star Designation décernée par l'Association for Psychological Science en 2013 et le Springer Early Career Achievement in Research on Adult Development and Aging de l'American Psychological Association en 2016. Son programme de recherche est financé par le National Institute of Health et la National Multiple Sclerosis Society. Voilà, merci à vous, Dr. Prakash. Uh, Dr. Prakash, it's a great pleasure to have you with us today. I now turn the presentation over to you. Thank you, uh, Aman. That was, I hope, a very kind introduction. Uh, <laughs> I, I got bits and pieces of it. So I really appreciate the introduction and I also really appreciate the invitation to be here. It really is quite an honor to be presenting to a group, a group of female neuroscientists and especially trainees because that's a field, that's a topic that I feel passionately about within our field of neuroimaging. So I'm going to go ahead and start my presentation, uh, but feel free to stop me at any point. I have about 40 to 45 minutes of uh, talk material prepared, but feel free to stop me at any point and I'm happy to answer questions or um, also wait on until the end to answer questions. So whatever works for you all. So let's see. All right, can you see the slides? Okay. Fantastic. Well, hello, everyone. Uh, I am Ruchika Prakash, and I am a faculty member in the Department of Psychology at Ohio State University. And today, the work, what I'm going to be talking to you all about are uh, some of the research projects that we have been doing in our lab towards developing reliable and robust brain-based mechanistic and endpoint markers. Um, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist and my research interests really are around looking at the effects of mindfulness meditation for cognitive and affective health. And much of the work that I have been doing has been with older adults or individuals with neurodegenerative disorders. So I run a lot of clinical trials, which is why I think you can see all my hair is graying out slowly. Uh, so I run a lot of clinical trials where where we systematically evaluate if engagement in mindfulness meditation can improve cognitive functioning and with a specific focus on attentional control, as well as reduce emotion dysregulation in, in different clinical populations. And a parallel line of research that we're interested in is developing and identifying brain-based signatures of attentional control and emotion dysregulation that we could then use as markers assessing whether our treatment had an impact on those neuromarkers or not. Uh, so before I get started with my research program, um, Aman asked me to give a little bit of an introduction about my background and where I uh, have, uh, where I come from. So just a bit about me. I grew up in India and I completed my bachelor's and master's in psychology at the University of New Delhi in India. And it was really my interest back in 2002, where I was interested in really looking at functional MRI and using it as a methodology that uh, uh, you know, got me interested in applying to graduate schools uh, in the United States. I 
put pictures of Indian food over here because if I was at university uh, was presenting in person, I would definitely request you to take me to an Indian restaurant, even though that's a very good stereotype. I am obsessed with Indian food and I always go to different places and I travel or used to travel a fair bit before the pandemic. And one of my joys used to be finding good Indian food and good sushi. So those are two things that I'm always looking uh, for. And for my students, I always say extra brownie points if um, you can suggest good Indian restaurants that I haven't heard of. Um, I received my PhD in clinical psychology at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and I pursued my doctoral degree with Art Kramer, who is a leading exercise neuroscientist. I've done a lot of work on looking at how exercise impacts cognitive health as well. And one of my coolest and nerdiest part of graduate school was when I first got there, the first semester uh, of my graduate school, Dr. Paul Lauterbur, who's considered, who received the Nobel Prize in Physiology for developing or for his contributions for the development of MRI, got the Nobel Prize and the university hosted a dinner uh, at the Beckman Institute where I used to work. Uh, and it was a black tie event. I was working late and I got somehow invited to uh, that dinner. I ended up having dinner with him. So that was the coolest part of graduate school. And since 2009, I have been a faculty member at Ohio State, uh, where I direct the clinical neuroscience lab. And this is my, you know, it's a team of highly motivated and dedicated graduate students, postdoctoral scholars, undergraduate students, and staff members who are committed to studying the effects of mind-body interventions. And we use a variety of neuropsychological methods as well as neuroimaging methods to answer our questions. Um, you know, I put the mission statement of our lab, but one of the things that's near and dear to my heart is that in all spheres of the work that we do, whether it's research, whether it's mentoring, whether it's service work, we strongly value our strong, our lab as a whole, strongly values our commitment to diversity and inclusion. Um, and so a lot of the things that we have been reflecting on in these past few years is based on this value system of trying to see how we can make academia as well as aspects of academia uh, inclusive and more representative representative. Um, I also direct our Center for Cognitive and Behavioral Brain Imaging. This is a state-of-the-art neuroimaging center that we have housed in the building in the, in the Department of Psychology here at Ohio State University, but it really brings together a community of researchers, faculty, graduate students, uh, uh, research scientists who are interested in brain imaging research, and we have users from across the entire university who are engaging in, in this research. So it's been really a pleasure to be able to direct the center as well as launch initiatives that again align with the values of enhancing diversity and equity. Uh, I've already said this, but some of the other things that I'm passionate about, as I said, was enhancing diversity and equity and inclusion in academia. And a few things that we've been doing is uh, a few years ago, we launched the early career BIPOC uh, Scholars Neuropsychology Lecture Series. And so this is a seminar series that my lab organizes where we have early career BIPOC scholars from really around the world. We've had speakers come in and present their work and just a platform for early career researchers to showcase the work. And this is held over Zoom and we often have quite a few people attend those seminars. So if anyone is interested in being considered a speaker for that, please definitely let me know. Um, as part of the center uh, that I direct, we've launched what's called the Advancing Diversity in Neuroimaging Research Initiative. And one of the things that we do as part of that initiative is that we identify undergraduate school uh, scholars or undergraduate students from underrepresented groups who are interested in pursuing neuroimaging research. Uh, and one of the obstacles that we've been able to identify is that a lot of these research positions, especially at undergraduate uh, years, requires that you volunteer in different labs. And we believe that that's a privilege that not everyone has. So this initiative provides funding to undergraduate students from underrepresented groups to pursue fund, uh, research in neuroimaging labs. And we provide them funding for two years. So they work in research laboratories for about 15 to 20 hours a week. And we pay them to do that research for about a two year period. We cover their application to graduate school. We provide funding for conference travel. So a number of different initiatives that, uh, uh, that, that we are launching within, within this umbrella term. 
And for those of you who are highly interested in this value system in recognizing that there is an urgent need within academia to address these diversity issues, I highly recommend reading an inclusive academy. In fact, I always joke that if I ever become the dean of our uh, institution, uh, of our college, I will make this a mandatory reading. Uh, and it really talks about how diversity is essential for all stakeholders in academia, whether it's undergraduate students or whether it's administration and institutions. And it really enriches our programs of research. It enriches our service work that we do, as well as, of course, the teaching mission of an institution. So highly recommend that. And something that may be relevant over here as well is uh, I'm passionate about normalizing, validating, and celebrating parenthood in academia. Uh, you know, I've had over the years quite a few undergraduate students and graduate students stop by my office where they've heard, when they've heard the message that you know, academia and family life just does not go together. And I'm here to say that they can. Of course, things are challenging, but that's just like in any other career. So we have a lot of discussions in our professional development seminar series about work-life balance, about parenthood, and how that is an integral part of who we are as academics. Um, and these are my three babies, two human and one for a baby, um, and they are an essential part of who I am as an academic. Um, and then doing rigorous open and reproducible science, right? We are definitely in the era where we are uh, wanting to ensure that a lot of the work that we are doing a is can be generalizable as well as we can disseminate it more openly. And the key to be able to do that is to do rigorous science and also open and reproducible. So we've been working towards our centers as well as our labs Git uh, lab page where we can post all of our materials, including our code, our uh, mindfulness manuals that we've developed, everything freely available so that people can access it. Because I know we as a lab have benefited a lot from people making their materials uh, freely available. So that's a little bit of an introduction to where what my background has been and the, some of the things that I'm passionate about. And again, feel free to ask questions or I'm happy to be contacted. I'll leave my email address in the chat folder uh, in, in the chat over here, but feel free to contact me if you have any questions on that. So getting started with uh, you know my research talk for today. So I thought that what I would do is um, the majority of the talk is focused on our brain-based biomarkers, but I wanted to give a little bit of a background on the mindfulness meditation work that I do. Uh, so I know when I used to first give these talks almost even 10 years ago, and I would ask the audience, how many of you have heard about mindfulness meditation? I would maybe get like one hand up, but I'm curious because this is uh, uh, at a different institution. How many of you have actually heard about the term mindfulness meditation? You want to just raise your hand or give me a thumbs up? All right. So a few people. I love that the hands are going up slowly. All right. And for those of you who haven't, let me give you a little bit of a definition of what this construct of mindfulness uh, really is. So mindfulness is, uh, you know, it's a construct that really has its origins in the Buddhist traditions. But John Kabat-Zinn is considered to be the founding person for translating a lot of that work and bringing it to the Western uh, society and packaging it in a program called the Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction Program. And I start with this definition because, uh, Sylvia, I'm curious if you have a question or if you uh, have just your hand up for the mindfulness piece. It might just be a hands up. Hand up, yeah. <laughs> no worries. Uh, so I always like to start with this definition of mindfulness and really just acknowledging that I can and I have given plenty of webinars just focusing and unpacking this definition of mindfulness. So I won't do complete justice to this, um, I would say, almost elusive construct of mindfulness, but I'll start with the definition that I think forms the basis of much of our work. So mindfulness is about 
paying attention. And the way that you pay that attention is per, is that it is purposeful. So you're doing so with intention. And the idea is to really open up to the experiences of the present moment. So in, a, in any given moment, you are you ha having a number of different experiences, whether it is sensory experiences, thought processes, emotions, um, 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 or sounds that you're experiencing and doing so in a non-judgmental way. Now, as I said, I won't do justice to this construct of mindfulness because I, I really could be talking about it uh, in an entire, for an entire hour. But what we've done is that, you know, and what the mindfulness-based stress reduction program does is that it's a manualized program where we invite our participants and our clients to engage in these formal and informal practices that allow us to cultivate or allow our clients to cultivate what's called sustained attention and also doing so in a framework of attitudinal foundations that promote non-judgment and acceptance. And so this is an eight week program where uh, and we have a mindfulness clinic here in the Department of Psychology where participants come to our uh, uh, come to our clinic. And that's where we engage in, in a lot of this work. So it's it's manualized, it's secular and it's scientific in its approach. And there has been a number of studies that have been looking at the effects of mindfulness based stress reduction program for a whole host of outcomes. But one of the things that I wanted you to take away from this definition is that attention and this idea of being able to sustain your attention is central to this construct of mindfulness. And in fact, the first randomized control trial looking at the effects of mindfulness meditation and how it may impact metrics of attentional control was done in 1973. So when we first, when we were first getting started with a lot of this work in terms of designing our clinical trials and what would be the outcome variables, how should we think about designing clinical trials, my graduate student, Stephanie Fountain Zaragoza, and who's now an assistant professor at, at Medical University of South Carolina, she and I undertook this review where we, we did a scoping review of the current state of literature, looking at the different studies that had been published all the way from 1973. And I think we uh, wrapped up this review in 2019 um, uh, to look at how many longitudinal studies had causally looked at the impact of mindfulness meditation for metrics of attentional control. And I'll walk you through this figure in just a few moments, but essentially what I want you to take home from that is that there were 57 studies at the time that had been looking at does engagement in mindfulness meditation improve cognitive uh, or not cognitive function, but specifically metrics of attentional control? And then also to emphasize or to underscore this point of attention being central to this construct of mindfulness, for any of you who may be, who are practitioners of mindfulness meditation themselves or follow scholars who do a lot of mindfulness teachings, attention and this ability to use attentional processes to alter information processing is really there present in, all, in a number of mindfulness teachings. When we talk about formal practices, right, what, do, what constitutes a formal practice of mindfulness meditation, whether it is breath awareness practice, whether it's body scan practice, or choiceless awareness, all of these practices really emphasize this ability to sustain your attention on uh, whatever anchor that you are choosing. And now there are a number of mindfulness measures as well. And there's a big debate in the literature in terms of what is this construct of mindfulness and what are the different facets of mindfulness. But one of the things that all of these measures kind of agree and converge on is that this ability to sustain attention is indeed a core construct of, or is a core component of mindfulness, uh, of this construct of mindfulness. Uh, so what we then did in the scoping review is that we really wanted to kind of understand, okay, where are the results pointing? Where do we see the most benefits of engaging in mindfulness meditation practice and actually getting benefits for facets of attentional control? Now, for those of you who are more fam who are familiar with attentional control literature, there are quite a few taxonomies that have been developed, but the one that we ended up using for the scoping review was the one that's been proposed by Posner and Peterson that classifies attentional control measures into alerting, orienting, and conflict. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go over through all three of these components, but if you have questions, happy to answer those uh, at, uh, at a later point. 
And what we found was that when it came to uh, alerting, uh, there's mixed evidence on metrics of alerting, especially on ton tonic alertness, which is really uh, something that we are measuring or that we are tapping into with mindfulness meditation. Hardly uh, any studies looking at orienting of attention, whether participants are orient their attention uh, based on top-down goals or bottom-up stimulus representations. But the strongest evidence we're seeing for executive control of attention, which really is, uh, is all about uh, you know, making your responses based on task rele relevant representations and ignoring the representation, ignoring the task irrelevant representations. And the two common tasks that were used in the literature were the flanker task, where you are basically asked to respond to the direction of the central arrow while ignoring the flanking arrows and the Stroop task, which uh, uh, is a very common task of executive control of attention that's used in the literature. Another thing that, you know, I had mentioned that I'll go over this figure in a little bit more detail, but another thing that we were really interested in doing uh, is that in clinical trials, you know, one of the things that you are interested in causally establishing is does your mindfulness meditation training or does engagement in mindfulness meditation practice causally impact your outcome variables? So we are interested in this causal pathway. And what we wanted to do was really in this review kind of understand the current state of the literature in terms of how did the different studies score uh, and how did they score in terms of the various criteria that are essential for evaluating a randomized control trial, so evaluating the assumptions of causality. And for that, we identified five criteria that were really important. So one was randomization of participants to a group. So a lot of the early studies within the mindfulness meditation were essentially feasibility studies, so pre and post. So you give measures to participants before the intervention, you give measures to them after the intervention. If they improve, um, then, that, then you can say, hey, mindfulness helps. But we know that practice effects are strong. People tend to do better on the second time as opposed to the first time. So that's not really causal evidence. Uh, whether they included an active control group or not in a randomized control trial, whether they paid attention to reduction of demand characteristics, you know, what were they doing in mindfulness meditation programs? There's a whole variety of practices that you could be doing. And so we, and if we really are to pool and do meta-analyses across different studies, we need to be understanding what exactly is it that people are doing. And then of course, following standardized guidelines for reporting of clinical trials. And what we found was that there were, you know, of the 57 studies that we had reviewed, only about seven studies met all of the essential criteria and half of them found benefits for my for attentional control while the other half so four and three uh, did not find benefits for attentional control um, and so you know taking a lot of this background and literature in mind we designed what we call our stage one pilot studies, where we really wanted to collect preliminary effects for whether mindfulness meditation can influence the metrics of attentional control that we were interested in. So we've done two studies so far, and these have been these have formed the basis for some of the pilot work that we have collected, and we are at the tail end of now completing our stage two studies. So one of them is the health trial, and I'll mostly talk about this, but if anyone is interested in the trial that we did with multiple sclerosis patients, we can talk, I can talk about that as well. But the health trial is the health education and lifestyle training study. And the primary aim of the study was to see if a mindfulness training impacted both mind wandering and attentional control in older adults. And uh, when I was talking about metrics of attentional control that we're interested in, one of the things that we've been interested in, in addition to attentional control, is this idea of mind wandering, uh, which I hope none of you are doing right now, and you're all focused uh, on this talk with me. But what we were able to show both through self-report uh, probes of mind wandering. So this is uh, uh, in these tasks, what we do is we present um, really long tasks of sustained attention to participants and then quasi randomly thought probes go up and we ask them, 
was your, you know, just before this probe went on, was your mind on the task or was it off task? And so you can assess measures of task unrelated thought, but an indirect marker of mind wandering that's used extensively in the cognitive aging literature is the response time uh, coefficient of variability. So this is the trial to trial variation in response time. And what we found was that participants in the mindfulness training group showed significant reductions both on this subjective measure of mind wandering, but also on this more objective yet indirect marker of mind wandering. So mindfulness training really showed uh, uh, help participants reduce their mind wandering in the context of these tasks of attentional control. Now, the question that you would ask is, well, what about attentional control? And trust me, if that result was significant, then I would have definitely presented that result first. Uh, but we actually did not. And this was a project that was done by my then graduate student, Patrick Whitmoyer, uh, who led this clinical trial. And what we found was that mindfulness training over and above our active control group did not differentially improve attentional control. In fact, both groups showed uh, improvements in attentional control following training, uh, both mindfulness and lifestyle education group. So one of the questions that we've been interested in, and I think as uh, the National Institutes of Health as well, is that are there moderators of these training effects, right? As a clinical psychologist, I often get asked the question is, you know, what is the pathway to cognitive health? And I'm 100% convinced that it's not one, right? So there are certainly participants for whom mindfulness meditation ends up working, but there are other participants for whom it does not work uh, um, at all. And so in a completely exploratory analysis and one that needs replication, uh, what we did was that we investigated if baseline working memory capacity, so we gave them the Weschler Adult Intelligence Scale and we computed the working memory index for all our participants, if baseline working memory capacities moderated the impact of mindfulness intervention on attentional control, and we hypothesized that, or we hypothesized that those with the lowest working memory capacity would be the ones actually who would benefit the most from mindfulness training. And as hypotheses work, that was not supported, but it was the actual opposite of uh, that what was supported, which was that mindfulness training was beneficial and for only for only for participants with high working memory capacity at baseline. Those that those are the participants that actually showed an improvement in attentional control. This is only for presentation purposes that I we dichotomized our working memory, but we used it as a continuous moderator. And we found that my working memory moderated the effects of mindfulness training on attentional control, such that those with higher working memory capacity were the ones who were benefiting from attentional control. And I think that this is an important finding, very, very in need of replication. But I think there are other training modalities, whether you look at psychotherapy or whether you look at cognitive training, is this idea about a lot of these interventions can be thought of as preventative interventions, right? So we've been, uh, there's been a lot of interest in seeing if mindfulness meditation can really be used um, as a training platform for reducing cognitive decline in Alzheimer's disease, or even when individuals with mild cognitive impairment. And our results seem to be suggesting that it seems to be beneficial, especially for attentional control for uh, older adults who have preserved and actually, in fact, high baseline uh, capacities of working memory. Now, an alternative interpretation to all of this would be that this training is uh, only, and this was a brief mindfulness pro training program, so this wasn't even the eight weeks of the intervention. We had created a four-week intervention program, and it is possible that with long, longer training durations, we would be able to see benefits not just for those with higher working memory capacity, but also with lower working memory capacity. Um, and so that's the training program that we have been doing for the last almost five years now. That's our stage two efficacy study that we're in the process of going through where we have 169 older adults going through a 12 month intervention period. And so we will be able to answer this question in a more systematic way is if longitudinal training will uh, uh, benefit uh, older adults with, who have more cognitive impairment at baseline. So, so stay tuned for those results. So what I wanted to, uh, so this is kind of a little bit of a background in the mindful, uh, on the mindfulness training work that we have been doing, but 
parallel to this, what we've been also interested in understanding are what are some of the neural, uh, neuronal fundaments of mindfulness training, right? What is the impact on some of the key canonical networks that support attentional control as a result of engagement in mindfulness training practices? And I put this meta-analysis up here because one of the things that has been true in much of the training literature, and I'm going to use the broad umbrella term of training because it's not restricted just to mindfulness training, but definitely true in exercise training, cognitive training, psychotherapy uh, as well, is that there is a range of heterogeneous findings in terms of looking at what are the canonical networks that are impacted with respect to training, and not just in terms of the uh, the uh, cortical subcortical circuitry that is impacted, but also when we, we've read studies where after training, people show an increase in activity in certain regions, and it's interpreted as that's a great thing. Um, you know, uh, with, with this training, mindfulness meditation, can you all hear me? I feel like my AirPods went down. Yeah. Uh, so, um, yeah, that mindfulness meditation, uh, you know, if there's an increase in activity, we say, oh, that's great because mindfulness meditation helps recruit the areas of the brain that are responsible for uh, attentional control. But then other studies will show a decrease in activation and then we will still interpret it. And I'm not talking about we, but I'm talking about the broad field of uh, training. And then we would say, great, the networks have gotten more efficient. So we haven't had these reliable brain-based signatures that have have been implicated with uh, that, that have been associated and that predict uh, reliably cognitive functioning. So this is a line of research that we almost started about five years ago, where we were interested in identifying robust and reliable markers of attentional control or, uh, you know, whatever domain that you're interested in using whole brain functional connectivity approaches. Uh, and the one approach that we've been using pretty systematically within our laboratory has been what's called connectome-based predictive modeling of uh, cognitive functioning. Um, and what this approach does is that it uses the entire connectome to generate models that predict cognitive function. And I think over the last I would say five to seven years, there's this really important realization that we've had in the field of neuroimaging is that when we think about these emergent cognitive constructs of um, attentional control or even emotion dysregulation decision making, rather than relying on one or two key canonical networks of the brain, really these uh, emergent cognitive constructs are byproducts of dynamic interactions across canonical networks. And by only a priori focus on one or two of these networks, we may be missing the, ra uh, the, the vast richness of variance that we may be getting once we take into account whole brain functional connectivity patterns. So the CPM approach, really it's a whole brain data-driven approach that allows for the identification of connectivity patterns within the individual's entire connectome that can be, and that have been found to be predictive of disease states, symptom severity and cognitive functioning. And it involves supervised machine learning algorithm and permutation testing to not just robustly generate predictive network-based models, but also validate them in external data sets. So one of the first set of studies that was done was uh, done by Monica Rosenberg and her colleagues at Yale University, where they use the CPM approach to establish a neuromarker of sustained attention using whole brain functional connectivity. And what they did was that they identified edges in the entire connectome that were associated with uh, better, uh, with high attention performance and edges that were associated with poor attention performance. And in their uh, first paper that was published, you know, it was only in 2016, where they found that sustained attention CPM in young adults, and it was generated used using 25 uh, young adults, and it predicted over 70% of the variance in sustained attention performance. Now, from the world that I was coming from, this was really great because because so far, using a priori canonical networks, we've only been able to predict about 9 to 10% of the variance in cognitive functioning. But I think what was more remarkable about some of this work that they had done 
was that it not only generalized to external data sets, but it also predicted performance across multiple domains of attentional control. So this task, the sustained attention neuromarker was developed using a gradual onset continuous performance task, which is a classic go, no go kind of a task, but they were able to predict uh, performance in a stop signal task in um, uh, in a in a Stroop task, and I'll show you the results of the Stroop task, uh, but also uh, in an attention network task. So across a number of different attentional control variables. Now, uh, for someone who is interested in in identifying a pattern of uh, functional connectivity, which we could then use as a marker for treatment gains. This was a really interesting finding. And so what we wanted to do was to try and see if this marker of attentional control would also generalize to predict functioning in um, a healthy older adults. So we set up a collaboration with their team and we had data on older adults um, during a Stroop task. And we wanted to see if this marker of attentional control would predict performance in younger and older adults in, in the context of a Stroop task. And what we found, and I'm here presenting the data combined across young and older adults, but it was significant for uh, both the groups separately as well, is that attentional, this neuromarker of attentional control or this pattern of distributed functional co connections across this high and low attention network predicted performance in both older and younger adults. And when you look at the combined network, which basically takes both the high attention as well as the low attention network, we were able to explain 38% of the variance in our combined sample of older and young adults. So really exciting that this neuromarker that was developed in young adults was able to predict uh, in the context of a grad CPT task was also able to predict attentional control in older adults. And we did some uh, network-based spatial uh, statistic analyses to really try and understand if there were certain sub-networks that explained age-related performances and attentional control perform, uh, performance. And what we found were we identified two sub-networks in the low attention network that explained, that mediated this, uh, uh, you know, or that explained uh, why there were age differences on the reaction time cost during the Stroop task. And both of these networks uh, provided support for this de-differentiation theory of brain networks that has been uh, proposed in cognitive aging for quite some time. But but essentially this idea is that as we get older, there is reduced differentiation of the different canonical networks and how they get recruited during different cognitive tasks. And there's more of an inter-network connection uh, across canonical networks. And that is what's really responsible for poor performance in older adults. And we were able to provide support for this theory using the approach that we did in this study. So uh, what, uh, what was great was that we had behavioral data as well as some neuro neuroimaging data that provided evidence for being able to identify a, a neuromarker of attentional control in older adults. So with all of this data, we went to NIH to fund our stage two efficacy study. And this is the study that has really uh, just, I've spent what I think the majority part of my of last five years uh, uh, executing this study. This is a 12 month mindfulness training trial where we have 169 older adults who are going through, uh, yeah, half of them get randomized to our mindfulness training group and then the other half uh, get randomized to what are we call our lifestyle education group. And we have spent a lot of time and effort in ensuring that the two groups are matched with respect to a number of different characteristics, a number of different demand characteristics. And and we collect data at all sorts of different uh, time points whether that's behavioral data, MRI data, and we also have markers of inflammation that we're collecting. And we're at the very tail end of this study as we, uh, um, uh, as we speak. So hopefully in another couple of years, we're going to have the results of this uh, study uh, published. So I think, uh, you know, one thing that I wanted to uh, also talk about is that in addition to, how, so our first set of studies that we did where we looked at this neuromarker of sustained attention and how that predicted attentional control in older adults was successful. So in a parallel line of research, what we started saying is that, you know, that was a marker that was developed in young adults. It was a small sample size of about 25 uh, young adults. But since we are interested in aging, what, we, what if we really try and derive 
connectome-based models in older adults because they then we will be able to identify functional connections that are predictive of attentional control performance in older adults. So this was a study that Stephanie did for her dissertation, uh, as well as um, uh, in collaboration with my other graduate student, Hina Manglani, where we, do, we gave them the grad CPT test, which was used in the original paper. And we had two independent data sets, one with a sample size of 48 participants and one with a sample size of uh, 87 participants. And, uh, uh, and the idea was that we were going to derive uh, the a neuromarker of sustained attention in health agers and see if it generalizes with the hypothesis that a marker that was derived for in older adults would generalize much better than a marker uh, that was derived in young adults. And that was unfortunately not true. So we derived uh, it in both sample one and sample two, uh, sample two and in sample one, the gen derivation just did not work. There was so much significant heterogeneity across brain behavior associations that we were not able to identify a consistent set of e edges that were predictive of attentional control performance in older adults. This model was successful in uh, the second sample and largely probably because we had a larger sample size, but then it did not externally validate in sample uh, in the first sample. And so there was significant heterogeneity in the functional neuroanatomy of predictive edges when we were deriving these uh, models in older adults. My postdoc, uh, um, Oye, Oye Tande Gabadian, and my graduate student, James Tang, were also interested in developing a marker of response time variability. As I mentioned before, you know, one of our consistent set of findings within the mindfulness training literature has been that mindfulness training helps reduce mind wandering in older adults. And this is a finding that has been replicated across a number of other mindfulness training studies with other uh, populations as well. So we were interested in also deriving a marker of mind wandering within older adults. And for this, what we ended up using was we, in, use a, uh, we ended up using response time variability with the caveat that we know that it's an indirect marker of, of mind wandering. And when we wrote, when we've written the paper, we've talked about mind wandering just as one of the Thinks that response time variability could be an indicator of. And uh, I've already talked about what response, response time variability is, but we use the HCP aging data set to build this RTCV model in older adults. And we had two external data sets to employ, uh, were employed to validate the models. And similar to the work that we've been doing with attentional control, what we found is that Connectome-based models trained solely on whole brain functional connectivity during task fMRI. So this was again derived during a go-no-go -no -go task, but not resting state fMRI, predicted response time variability in healthy older adults. Uh, to just state it in, in other words, so when we derived this model based during task-based fMRI, we were able to successfully predict RTCV, but the same model, uh, if, we, if you use resting state fMRI, was not significant. And similar to the results in our, prior pro in our previous project, this model that was derived with, I think, about 145 older adults did not generalize to any of the external data sets. And this is a finding that we've been having, not just in our work with older adults, but also in our work with MS patients, is that when we're deriving models based on clinical populations, uh, for the most part, they end up being significant. You can identify a set of consistent edges that predict performance, but those models don't end up generalizing to other data sets. So what are some of the future directions in terms of the work that we are uh, doing? And there's a lot of follow-up that we're, that we're interested in doing. So the first and the foremost, which is something that we are all, we've all spent and my entire lab has spent a lot of time in, is that we're interested in examining the impact of a 12-month mindfulness trial on network strength of the sustained attention. Here we have 169 older adults randomized to either the mindfulness 
uh, based stress reduction program or the lifestyle education group. And we really will be able to see, since we've been able to identify a, a neuromarker of sustained attention in older adults, we will be able to see if mindfulness training strengthens the neural circuitry that supports attentional control. And that has been validated in other data sets. We have fMRI data collected at pre-training, post-training, and at the 12-month follow-up. So that's our mindfulness work that we're doing. Uh, but truly what we are interested in uh, also understanding is what are some of the age variant and age invariant edges that predict attentional control. So the wonderful thing with the HCP data set is that we have data collected all the way from uh, participants age at 36 to uh, I think 106 is if I remember correctly. So it's a long developmental uh, sample that we have. And we know that when we look at behavioral data, and I'm sorry, this is hard to see, uh, is that when you look at attentional control and when you look at RTCV, it stays consistent up until around your mid-60s. That's when the decline in attentional control as well as mind wandering starts happening. So you can identify these inflection points. So we're now in the process, uh, one of my graduate students is now in the process of taking a look at the entire HCP data set and using connectome-based predictive modeling to identify both age variant and age invariant edges. You know, there is a lot that has been said about all of these processing degrees of freedom that we have as researchers in terms of the impact that it would have in terms of building robust brain-based models of cognitive functioning. And there have been benchmarking studies that have been done, but most of that work has been done in uh, young adult populations. But when it comes to clinical populations, when it comes to older adults, given the significant heterogeneity that we see, one of the projects that a research scientist at our center is undertaking is that what is the impact of a different number of these analytic pipelines in terms of building these brain-based biomarkers. So what is the impact of choice of brain parcellation scheme, right? So whether it's functional, anatomical, or data-driven, uh, what is uh, the impact of how you compute the cross-correlation between time series, the choice of different uh, pre-processing steps, and how do you use different machine learning classifiers? What is the impact of all of this in deriving these uh, brain-based signatures of uh, cognitive functioning in clinical populations? So that's a project that we are working on right now. Uh, and another thing that I think ties in with uh, when I started my presentation is this idea of really emphasizing diversity within academia and all fronts of academia. There is an urgent need to go beyond proportional representation. And I think there's a dire need within the field of neuroimaging and neuroscience to really start thinking about uh, ensuring whether our work that we're doing and whether the sample of participants that we're collecting are representative and include the experience and perspective of minoritized participants. And I'll give you the example of Alzheimer's disease. And this is mostly within the United States, but Black and Hispanic older adults are projected to comprise 40% of those living with Alzheimer's disease by 2050. When you look at the predominant Alzheimer's clinical trials or brain-based models that we've been developing, ADNI is a good example, right? The Alzheimer's Disease Neuroimaging Initiative, the data that is available right now only includes 4% minoritized uh, older adults in, in the ADNI sample. And if we want our models to be generalizable, because that is an important component of, gen of, of the work that we're doing, we need to go beyond proportional representation. And it almost has to be done and, you know, it's, of course, a lab specific thing, like, you know, we all have to be individually working in our labs to increase representation, but also centers and institutes need to be making uh, uh, advances in this. If anybody is interested, at our center, we've established an advisory board to help create community, to help create a uh, help liaison between what the work that we are doing in uh, 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 at the university and the work that the communities are interested in. And it's not just for recruitment of participants, but it also is for mutual exchange of information for our work to be more applicable, to be more useful to these communities. Um, so happy to talk to anyone who's interested in, in establishing these advisory boards because that there has there have been lots of important lessons that we have learned along the way. 
So I'll end my talk by thanking my village of uh, 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 researchers. Clinical trials really cannot happen without the dedication and perseverance of a village of people. And for the work that I talked to you today, especially my postdoc, Oye Gabadeyan, uh, my graduate student, Stephanie Fountain Zaragoza, Patrick Fitmoyer, uh, Megan Fisher, and then my staff members, Saif Bachari, Rosie Cantor, and Brandon Kinsler. Um, if you're interested in accessing any of our mindfulness materials when the pandemic started, uh, we always wanted to make our materials publicly available, but when the pandemic started, we launched a YouTube channel and basically put all of our mindfulness practices and our explanation of a lot of these constructs on this freely available ad-free YouTube channel. So please feel free to access that. And I thank you for your time and your um, uh, focused attention during this task or during this talk. Thank you, Ruchika. That was a fantastic talk. Um... I learned a lot. Um, there is one question uh, from the audience so far, uh, and I encourage everybody to ask uh, additional questions by raising their hands. We'll unmute you and we'll put the video on. Uh, so there's a question is, is the differentiation equivalent to desegregation? Desegregation. I think it, it is a similar idea. It's this, uh, you know, I think de-differentiation takes both the integration as well as the segregation of networks into account. It's this idea that as we get older, the cortical nodes of a canonical network, their crosstalk starts decreasing, which is a measure of integration, but then nodes uh, or cortical nodes of different canonical networks start interacting with other canonical networks. And that's usually a measure of integration. So it takes both of those ideas into account. Also, Ruchika, did you want to take down your last slide? So a lot of people are showing uh, their would like to yes, see them. Uh, perfect. Thank you so much. Uh, yes. So go ahead and ask. Uh, did, did somebody want to ask first? <laughs> the awkward silence before. Okay. Uh, I can ask. Um, I'll is. start asking. Okay. So, I mean, just like general biology, when you're learning something, you're making connections. And then when you become efficient at it, you start, you know, releasing some of those connections and you have this efficient, more efficient connection, but not that many. I've always wondered how, you know, in aging, what we see is potentially like not delineated enough connections or like the interconnections increasing or even decreasing sometimes the networks become like more in within connected versus interconnected. Since you're doing so much work on healthy aging, what is your overall take on what's actually happening with, with these connections when we start aging? And at what age does this set, you know, differentiation starts taking place? That's a really good question, and uh, I'll give you my perspective on it, but I think that there is a lot more work that needs to be done when uh, it comes to developmental samples, right? So if you look at the majority of the cognitive aging work, it tends to be, uh, folk, you know, we recruit a bunch of young adults and we recruit a bunch of older adults and we do a comparison across the two groups. But the question that you're asking is actually a very sophisticated question that requires these longitudinal samples. And there are some studies that have looked at it. So I don't want to give the impression that there have been no studies, but the majority of studies that have spoken to this idea of de-differentiation, whether it was in the context of when we were looking at just one or two regions of the prefrontal cortex to moving to looking at the frontal parietal network and the default mode network. And now we're looking at whole brain studies have really taken people on the extreme end of the spectra uh, on these two spectrums. And honestly, in the last, I would say, few years, we have been really interested in maybe it's because I have entered midlife phase and we always say academics are nothing but narcissists. Uh, so we are now interested in midlife uh, as well. But I am really interested in seeing how these patterns and these theories that we've had about cognitive aging play out in these developmental samples. And so where where do the integration and the seg oh, uh, and the segregation end? 
end up shifting? I think that's still an open question from my perspective and question that I think samples like the HCP data set would be able to answer. But I think it's safe to say that one of the findings that has been replicated across aging studies is this uh, decrease in modularity values, right? And, and modularity, again, is a graph theory metric that represents this interplay between integrator, integration metrics and segregation metrics. And I think that's, uh, uh, and I have a research scientist that just looked at modularity across the entire uh, HCP sample from 36 to 106, and you have very robust evidence for decline in modularity values. And you can you know, apply these um, inflection analyses where you can identify the points at which you start seeing changes in modularity. And at least in her data, or at least in her analyses, it's right around early 60s where you start seeing shifts in modularity. Uh, but I think it's these developmental lifespan samples that we need to more sophisticatedly answer some of those questions. Um, and also, you know, this project that I was talking about identifying age variant and age invariant edges, uh, that would be a, a small piece of the puzzle as well, because there will likely, and, and I'm saying it with confidence because I've seen some of us, is that there will likely be a set of edges that are age invariant that explain that predict attentional control. Uh, so we've looked at the sample from 36 to 106 years old, and there are a set of edges that we've been able to find which predict attentional control, whether you look at age as a continuous variable or you bin people in different groups. But there are also a set of age uh, variant edges that only explain attentional control in or in young adulthood, in middle adulthood, in early old age, and in late old age. Um, so I think uh, I, I just think that the AC, ACP sample hopefully will be able to answer some of our questions. Uh, Anna and uh, Dr. Ansaldo, please go ahead and ask your question. You're on. Oh, maybe did you get muted again? Um, can we um, unmute Dr. Yes. <laughs> okay, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Rushika. Very interesting talk. In fact, we need, we really need to discuss because, you know, uh, we are also using this uh, connectome approach to study attentional processes in bilinguals, and we are also using Posner's uh, paradigm. Unfortunately, Tanya Dash, who is the, the person who has done the work, has just left. She couldn't stay. So I will, um, I will ask the question uh, that we were discussing together. Uh, given, given that we know that uh, bilingualism is a factor that uh, improves uh, executive control, because I guess that when you talk about attentional control, you're talking about this subcomponent of tension. I wonder if you were controlling for that in your studies, because I think that could be a confounding variable that could maybe introduce noise into your studies and prevent you from seeing the effects you're looking at. So Fascinating idea. Uh, we haven't controlled for bilingualism. Uh, we do collect that data and I've looked at that data and I would say maybe three or four of our participants are in fact bilingual, uh, unfortunately. And this is where, you know, this idea of having better representation in our studies is, is so important because we, we just haven't done a good job and we are working towards that. Uh, the last wave of data collection that we're doing right now is with minoritized older adults and bilingualism is more present in minoritized older adults as opposed to our sample of non-Hispanic whites. Uh, and if you do that, according to the results we have, you should do that uh, because you say two or three are bilinguals, but how bilingual is a bilingual? I mean, uh, it's in the continuum of bilingualism that we see. So you may know a little bit of a second language, a little bit more, yeah. be absolutely bilingual. And it makes a difference even at, let's say, at not very high levels yeah. of bilingualism. And it is also uh, different depending on age. So I think we need to sit down together and discuss yeah. because we have many interests in common and uh, it would be very interesting also to see if, for example, regarding your results uh, with the mindfulness training and the lack of effects uh, at the level you were looking at, 
Yeah. Maybe it's because they would be better in alerting than yeah. in executive control. Yeah. Uh, because I guess mindfulness is something uh, that, yes, allows you to stop your mind from wandering, yeah. but it keeps you alert in a certain way. So anyways, these ideas I wanted to share with you. Absolutely. I love the bilingualism idea. And I think, you know, within the HCP data set, I'll go back to my student and who's looking at this sample of 600 people, we could definitely look at it in a much more systematic way. And um, I'll get a, get back into and, it. And, and, and polyglots also. I mean, I don't know where you recruited your participants, or where, where these people come from, but uh, I think it would be a factor that would be worth looking at. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, as, as in response to your alert, alerting question on mindfulness, there have been quite a few studies that have looked at mindfulness and alerting and very and almost most of them have actually found no evidence for mindfulness training to impact alerting. And there was a uh, meta-analysis that was published that looked at, again, how mindfulness training impacted alerting, orienting and uh, executive control of attention. And, you know, I uh, I facilitate mindfulness programs. I'm a my practitioner of mindfulness. So I hear you on saying that mindfulness maintains an alerting, alertness, a state of alertness. But even in that meta-analysis, the effect sizes for alertness were very, very small. Okay. Okay. Uh, well, thank you. Maybe we can discuss later on. Thank you. Pierre, do you want to go ahead? Oh. Nicole. Um, perfect. Uh, the microphone, uh, microphone doesn't work. I don't have control over it. Uh, I think at this point we can probably unmute everyone. Can, can because, you hear me? Yes. Yeah, perfect. <laughs> Is it better? Yes. yes. Okay, good. Sorry. Um, well, so, so first, thank you very much, uh, Richika. The, 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 your talk was wonderful. It's also, uh, I, I need to express my thanks to uh, Aman also to start this uh, new seminar series. I think you're very inspiring as a first speaker in this series. It's uh, really a, a great message, uh, not only for the, the science, but also for the EDI message that you send out and not just sending the message out, but just acting on this message in your own research. I think this is great. I have two very quick questions on, on your research. Um, the first one is, is very simple. Have you looked at um, um, change, structural changes uh, in your, uh, in your uh, training program, uh, brain structural changes? We haven't. Uh, I, uh, you know, we control for a structural volume in our effects, but um, just based on my research interest, I've always been interested more in functional changes as opposed to structural changes. Uh, but I'm sure there will be a student who would, you know, these days our problem is so much data. <laughs> so, sure, uh, yeah. Yeah, so I'm sure there will be a student who will come along and be like, I want to look at how mindfulness training changes uh, the structure. And we do collect DTI data. We do collect, you know, very high resolution MP-Rage images. Um, uh, but that's not been my primary hypothesis or high primary aims that I've looked at. I, I, I would hope you'd find some, some effects in attentional networks. We've looked at that in very small samples uh, many years ago in, uh, in experienced uh, meditators yeah. in relation to pain regulation. We did find uh, cortical thickness differences in attentional, so uh, more thicker uh, cortical um, areas in the attentional networks in relation uh, to pain regulation to the ability to re regulate, self-regulate pain. So I think you might find also yeah. interesting effects in relation to your uh, behavioral uh, attentional measures. Yeah. The other question is maybe a bit more difficult. Um, so of course you define mindfulness, not just as attentional training. Uh, of course, if you ask any person who trains in meditation or anyone who has trained in Zen meditation in particular, um, the, the, the goal is not really to train your attention. Attention is just a means to get to you know, non-judgmental perception, experience, and yeah. maybe uh, reduce your emotional reactivity, which yeah. does not mean not having emotions, but 
yeah. not uh, reacting to your uh, emotions. So yeah. there's, a, there's a practical question in terms of your experimental paradigm. Do, yeah. do you have means to measure those other concepts? And do you find in your clinical trials, do you find impacts on other outcomes that yeah. are more related to quality of life, for example? Absolutely. That's a really, really great question. And I think a very important one as well. So I have a whole talk prepared for emotion dysregulation. So I also, we also tend to focus on emotion dysregulation, both in our work with older adults, but also more so in our work individuals with multiple sclerosis. So for those of you who are not familiar, MS is a neurodegenerative disorder where prevalence rates of depressed mood and anxiety disorders is between 50 to 70%. So that means that one in every two patients is walking in with a clinically significant uh, you know, diagnosis of mood or anxiety disorders. And emotion dysregulation is like this transdiagnostic construct that really underlies a number of uh, these mood and anxiety disorders so in that work, we've been looking at, we found evidence and we've published that mindfulness training over and above both an active control group, but also a weightless control group uh, improve, reduces emotion dysregulation in the context of both like self-report measures, but also a behavioral task of worry and rumination. So we do have some evidence with that. Uh, with that. Uh, you know, I think the thing the challenge of doing clinical trials, there's so many challenges, right? Like you have to uh, do this, do this in a robust way where you can actually causally say that it's my training that's mm -hmm. actually showing improvements and not, it's not all of these other placebo factors of social support and just moving around that's doing that, but also how do you select outcome variables that are grounded in psychological sciences? And so I think I completely understand that as a scientist, we're mostly just touching the tip of the iceberg with some of these measures, right? There's so much more mm -hmm. in a mindfulness meditation program. Uh, there's a lot of emphasis these days in looking at mindfulness meditation as a tool, not just for gaining intrapersonal awareness, all right, enhancing attentional control or enhancing emotion regulation, but also how does it impact our interpersonal relationships? Mm -hmm. So there's been uh, studies that have been looking at the if impact of mindfulness meditation on theory of mind or empathy. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of these questions that you can uh, answer uh, or you can ask, but I'm, I'm well aware that we're touching with the iceberg and that's why I have a long way to go before retirement. So <laughs> I'll be asking some of those questions then. Great, thanks. Absolutely. Alex, go ahead. Um, how much time actually do we have? Can I? Uh, um, how much time can you? I do? mean, I don't want to lock people here. It's after one. But if there's some interesting discussions going on, I, I would encourage it. If Dr. Prakash has time, obviously. So. Sure. Yeah. But people yeah. who need to leave, like, please don't feel obligated to stay. <laughs> So. Uh, Dr. Prakash, thank you, thank you very much for this marvelous uh, presentation. It, it, very intriguing. I was um, I'm very interested about many parts of this uh, research. Uh, I'll have one question uh, in line with the same question that uh, Dr. Ravil said. From your perspective, um, well, based on based on my current knowledge about meditation mindfulness, so as uh, as it was clearly outlined, there is at least one another type, the Zen meditation, but there is also the Buddhist meditation, which is another type of meditation. Then there is the meditation on nothingness. Then is meditation on uh, like specific things. So every each of them activates probably activates different uh, different functional network, so to say. So if the mindfulness activates the attentional network, I would expect that the meditation on nothingness would activate, uh, I don't even know what. The thought mode network, because that's oh, our- thank, thank that's you very much. <laughs> so I was wondering if you could comment on this uh, potential generalizability of results from studies on mindfulness, on how could they be interpreted, adjusted, applied, uh, combined with the results from other types of uh, meditation, like for example, Zeno. Absolutely. That's really, that's a really great question. And I think, uh, you know, it's, it's not just that there are different types of meditations, but there's also the fact 
what you have participants do inside the scanner, right? Like, so the context is really important as well. So for example, I'm focusing on attentional control, like we did give, have them do the grad CPT test. And of course that would, whether you're doing the pra mindfulness pr practice or whether you're doing Zen meditation or transcendental med meditation, you know, a task of attentional control will elicit hopefully the attentional networks of the brain. But if I give somebody a task on emotion regulation, that is activating different networks of the brain. So I think, you know, context becomes really important when we're doing these, uh, these studies. Uh, it's, you, you know, a lot of these meditative practices have quite a few features in common as well. And that is where, that's why I have kind of honed in on this idea of attentional control is that in all of this work, what we are trying to work with is this we're working with the wandering tendency of the mind, right? Anybody who is engaged in meditative practice now uh, uh, or over here can say that our mind is wandering at all times. Even when we feel like we're going to be focusing on something, it's out there. So in, in Zen meditation, and I will not call myself an expert in all of these meditative practices. I've spent the better part of a decade focused on mindfulness meditation, both in my professional work, but also in my personal practice as well. And even within mindfulness meditation, right, you have focused attention practices, you have open monitoring practices, you have loving kindness meditation practices, you have so many different kinds. And I don't think we are right now there where we can say focused attention practices are the only ones that improve attentional control. And then loving kindness meditation only improves emotion regulation. Um, and I think the question for me that's interesting is I always think that the sum is greater than, than, than its parts. So I, as a clinical psychologist who actively works with patients, I'm not even that interested in saying, okay, which component of this is that interested? I think this program as a whole, engaging in these meditative practices, seem like it's benefiting attentional control and emotion dysregulation. So, so I think to answer your questions in terms of generalizability of findings to uh, all meditative practices, I think that's an open empirical question. I don't think anyone has really uh, compared these, but you know, for those of you who do clinical trials, these inferiority trials where you are comparing, doing a head-on comparison are require thousands of like, if you do a power analysis, it will say you need 8,000 people to actually run an inferiority trial. And that's just not gonna happen until we scale them. And it will, it will happen with things like, you know, headspace like apps or something. And then one of the next frontiers that I'm working on, and this is something the pandemic has made us realize is that, you know, if we want to make our interventions accessible to the public populations that we're interested in, we have to talk about scalability. And one of the ways we scale it is by making them available through apps and through validated programs. And that's when you could actually test it in thousands of people, but it will take a lot of work to go from here to there. Thank you very much. Absolutely. So I have a question that maybe you've already looked at. Did you find differences between sex? Um, Males and females. Yeah. We did not. So the great part has been that we have uh, about 50% males and 50% females uh, in our study. So we have a good representation. But when we looked at, you know, we've, um, I want to say, did we look at it as a covariate? No, but we looked at it separately in males and females, but there weren't any effects over there. And the study that we're doing right now uh, with 169 older adults is also, uh, we have a good representation of both males and females in, in the study sample. And I think we should be able to, I don't know if we're powered enough to detect three-way interactions, uh, but at least try to start looking at some of those effects would be, would be useful. I think I'll ask one last question or if somebody else has, please raise their hand. But what you've been describing is, you know, like you find signatures in one population, but it's very hard to reproduce them in another. That seems to be a general theme in functional MRI studies in health or disease. Like I work with Alzheimer's and it's the same issue. Yeah. Uh, so more and more, like at least for the disease population, we've been um, venturing towards like subtyping and addressing that there's heterogeneity and subtyping the heterogeneity in some way and then looking for signatures within that subtype. Yeah. So I just wonder if instead of just applying it for disease states, we should also apply it 
you know, in healthy individuals because we're assuming that everybody's wired the same. And, yeah. you know, if they're not, then yeah. obviously we will, you know, we, there's, we can't yeah. generalize. So Absolutely. have you given thought to that? Yeah, I feel like that's what keeps me up at night. <laughs> So, uh, you, you know, I think at least what we found, and again, you know, this is literature so much in its infancy and there's new stuff that's coming out uh, at all times. What we have found, so we've, we've found that our models that we've derived in older adults and in clinical populations, including MS, do not generalize. But the models that were derived in young adults or using the, the young HCP data set, that has almost always generalized to our data sets, which was counterintuitive and exactly opposed, uh, you know, opposite to what we would have hypothesized. We thought that, you know, if you derive a model in MS patients, it would generalize better to predict functioning in MS patients. So this was a paper that we published in Brain Connectivity where we wanted to derive a working memory neuromarker for our exercise trial that's been ongoing. And we had two samples and we derived it in the first sample. The derivation was significant, but the same sample collected in the same town, you know, similar set of uh, 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 ethno-racial uh, differences and, and sex-based differences did not generalize. But a working memory neuromarker that Monica Rosenberg and her team had developed with the HCP data set did not include any MS patients. It was all young adults that generalized to predict working memory in both samples and completely different tasks. It was not the uh, uh, HCP task as well. So, so at least across two studies, we have some data that these models that are being generalized, developed in young adults are generalizing. So I think maybe because of, you know, with aging, with disease, there are changes in brain structure, there are lesions with MS patients, so that we're unable to identify a consistent set of edges that would predict behavior. But in young adults, we're able to do that because there is more uniformity in terms of the neuroanatomy of the brain and, and the functional connections as well. Uh, and that's why I think the HCP project that we're undertaking, which will allow us to look at both age variant and age invariant edges, would be useful, but I think your point is well taken as well is that what about subtypes, right? Whether, uh, and the subtype research in young adult and gen young adults population has to be approached cautiously. Um, you know, one of the things that we've been looking at in, in uh, study sections is people are interested in ethno-racial disparities, but then does that have that, could that then start getting interpreted is that as you know, whites organize their brain this way, blacks organize their brain this way, South Asians organize. So we have to be very cautious when we think about subtyping when it comes to brain-based signatures. Um, and the same thing for males and females, right? Like, or it has the potential to really cause harm if we're not careful about how we approach these subtyping of brain-based signatures. Um, so I think we just have to be careful, but it certainly is a factor that we should consider. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Actually, one of the one of the trainees who approached me, I was bringing up like you know, look, finding a scale for gender because male and female doesn't define gender by itself. It depends on you know what kind of edu you know work you do, etc. And the trainee was really offended by wanting to dichotomize males and females because again, she, you know, she brought up that it could be a basis for you know more bias and more. Yeah. Uh, you know, and combination every based on that. So, um, yeah, I, I think as scientists, we really need to be careful on how we um, phrase things and how we conduct research in, in these kind of domains that can be misinterpreted by by media and the lay media in as well. So on that note, I really, really very much appreciate you staying 20 minutes over for, for this discussion. Um, Thank you for exposing us to all the um, uh, EDI work you've been incorporating in, into your own work as well as this, the institute. And you know, we might I might reach out to you and ask you for some suggestions to, you know, maybe integrate some of that in, in the different organizations I'm in, as well as like maybe our institutes would be in, interested in that as well. So again, thank you so much and merci à tous for all of you for hanging out for so long. Um, I really appreciate it. Thank you. 
Absolutely. Thank you so much, Aman, for the uh, for the invitation, but also for this amazing discussion. It was so, it's always lovely to talk about uh, um, uh, these research topics. So thank you everyone for your time and anytime, feel free to reach out. It's always lovely to connect with you. Thank you. Thank you very Bye. much. Bye.